I'm Charlie Rogers, and I'm going to be presenting on a rocket stove and thermoelectric charging. And this was the project I chose for my keen project this semester. Uh, so my outline, I'm going to start off with the problem and the analysis that kind of went into how we established that problem and how we're going to move towards the solution. And then we'll look at the solution, why, um, when you analyze it, it looks better, the thermodynamics of that, and then the thermoelectric cell as well. So the first problem. So uh, this is the common brazier that you find in the community in Zambia. Uh, the community we specifically work with is Zambezi, and that community is in the western half of Zambia. Uh, it's a very rural community. Uh, in Zambia, Lusaka is a very developed city. It's the capital. It's and uh, that's you know very high, higher standard of living than these rural towns. And so this kind of stove you picture here is what they use to cook majority of their food and for water purification. Uh, it's a cultural kind of idea that um, when, you, when you go into a home, the water you're going to get is going to be hot water, and that symbolizes that it's clean. And that kind of goes back to these cheap stoves that are produced from parts in the junkyard and um, other kind of scrap they can find around. And so the pros are the low cost, um, made from abundant parts. Um, they're very easy to start. Uh, the technique is, as you can see the handle on it, put the charcoal in, they light it up, and they spin that around to get airflow through the stove to get it to get it going. And the cons are there's no heat rejection. So the sides are porous, they're open, um, wind readily flows through, and it aids in making it easy to start, but ultimately it causes it to have very low efficiency as it's burning. Um, easily can burn the user, spinning it around, it's easy for embers, um, you know, embers, charcoal to fall out and burn the person using it. And then heavy smoke's produced. And the part about the heavy smoke is really important because in the rainy seasons and a lot of seasons of the year, these are burned inside. And uh, that heavy smoke accumulates within the residence. And so last year we had some, some students go and they report back and say, you walk into one of these houses and your eyes stain, you feel it all over. And so the prolonged impact of smoke from stoves like this isn't going to be realized for 20 some years as it accumulates in the lungs. Uh, this is kind of an analysis of how this stove works. Uh, the fuel sits on an elevated platform, it's porous underneath, and that, that whole area underneath can let air in from the sides, get that cool ambient air coming in, the updraft comes up through the fuel, combusts and come out, comes out the top. Uh, so when we'll look at the electronics in Zambia, and this is one of the things we're gonna, when we are looking at the stove, it's, it's a separate thing from stoves right now, but by bringing it in, we can help market our new stove and justify its higher price to uh, people in Zambia, because the hard thing is that the long-term impact of their older stoves is hard to put, is hard to feel in a concrete sense. But electronics are a huge driving thing right now, and they have to, they have to pay almost 75 cents to get some of their electronics charged. So that's a short-term benefit that we can show in our newer stove that'll help um, sell that and justify its pricing. And, and contrary, I don't know how many people actually believe how prevalent cell phones are in Zambia and Africa as a whole. Um, a lot of monetary transactions happen, um, wire transfers, bank transfers, um, in some countries millions of dollars are moved every day uh, via cell phones, and as well as communication like we would use. And most individuals over 20 years old have one of these cell phones. So this is the solution that we proposed. Um, it's a rocket stove, and so what a rocket stove is, is a rocket stove it, I was looking at the construction later, but essentially it's, it's not a forced air stove, but it gets some of the similar benefits because it uses natural buoyancy of the hot air rising out to help suck in cool air. And so it gets some of those benefits of a forced air stove without actually needing to be driven by electricity. Uh, so insulated to contain heat, we'll kind of look at that a bit later. Um, the auto fuel, uh, fuel feed is achieved via, um, the fuel comes in at a 45 degree slope, so as the fuel at the bottom is burned, the other fuel up above keep, continues falling down into uh, the, the, the chamber. Cell phone charging is an addition on this stove. It's portable. It's not quite as portable as their earlier stoves. It, it weighs about 20 pounds. And we made a lot of strides to decrease its weight because uh, even earlier prototypes of this stove were considerably heavier in the range of 30 to 40 pounds. And that was mainly due to the insulation. Greater heating capacity. So this stove, for the same amount of fuel, put about twice as much heat. Or conversely, same kind of meal, you're going to use about half as much fuel to heat that water or cook that food. The smoke is considerably clearer. We did some, we did some testing at some 
um, independent uh, companies who measured our particulates, and they, kept, they uh, caught those particulates in HEPA filters, and we were able to weigh out um, what the particle sizing was on this stove. And so, as it goes along with the clear smoke, is there is considerably uh, less emissions coming out. So how this stove works, um, so the pot sits up on top, and it's elevated on three bolts, and that allows the exhaust to rise out of the top and then out around the sides of that pot. Uh, the fuel intake is on the side, as well as the air intake. Um, not pictured too well in that picture, but the air intake is below the fuel intake. It's separated by uh, a piece of sheet metal, and that way, even if you have the, the fuel chute full of charcoal lumps, um, you're not going to start with oxygen because it's divided, so the air can move underneath all that. And so then, picture on the right-hand side, you kind of see the general airflow through this stove, as opposed to the uh, other stove earlier. So the cool air comes in on the side, as it combusts, it rises out the top. And that, as the hot air rises, it sucks in more cool ambient air on the side. So that's how you kind of get a forced air effect, and it helps you retain a lot more heat in the core. So the construction of this one is, we built ours in a, uh, in a five gallon bucket, metal bucket, and the the insulation is made papercrete, which is cement with um, with torn up cardboard. Essentially, we put it through a, a tree or a, a tree chipper, but you can tear it up by hand. But it's, you're mixing cement and cardboard, and it produces this considerably less dense insulation material. So in the earlier prototypes were just solid concrete, and they're pretty heavy. Um, the metal bucket, uh, so scavenged from junkyard, we ordered ours just because they're available here, but we have, we, ha we have faith that there's pretty similar ones in Zambia, and when we go there um, on May 12th, we will we'll go search for those similar kind of buckets and you know, hopefully find something like it or modify something to, to suit that need. Uh, and then the sheet metal, the core um, that goes uh, down the middle is sheet metal, and then there's the papercrete, and then there's the outside metal bucket. So it, it, the paper crates have sandwiched in the middle to help insulate. So this is the further detail on how we added the cell phone charging in onto that stove. This is just a test rig. So this isn't actually how it's hooked up on the stove, but it kind of illustrates how it would work. So on this setup, on the bottom side is the cold side. That's just a big hunk of aluminum that's holding at room temperature because of just its sheer mass. Uh, the thermoelectric cell is the white piece in the middle. And on the top is a heat sink, and that's a heat gun was directed to that heat sink to collect the heat coming off that heat gun. So then the heat traveled from the thin hot side on top through the thermoelectric cell and into that thermal mass on the bottom. And so some of the notable things is that the, the voltage outputted by a thermoelectric cell varies proportionately to the temperature. And so uh, that's one challenge because most modern electronics need a very steady voltage to be, to be used. So this is more detail on thermoelectric cells. Uh, essentially, they can be made out of a couple different materials, semiconductors or pure metals. Uh, a lot of the ones manufactured nowadays are made of semiconductors, um, just because they, uh, they have higher efficiency as opposed to metals, and they can be shaped in these tiny little uh, structures. So on the right-hand side, you see how this one little snapshot of how complex one of these structures could be with all the semiconductors laid out in a grid. And then on the left hand side you see a snapshot or a cross section of one of those semiconductor. This is an individual cell of many hundreds and thousands that we built into a thermoelectric cell. So essentially a thermoelectric cell is many thermocouple like devices listed up in series to achieve a usable voltage. And so on the left hand side if you're, you have your P-doped semiconductor and your electrons move towards the high heat source on that side. They move through the high heat side on top and then they come down on the end dope side. And so, note on the bottom, how, because there's that divider on that bottom, on the cold side, that's an electrical insulator. So the negative terminal and positive terminal are electrically insulated from each other on the bottom, so it must travel up through the high heat side and then back down. So on the positive terminal here, you can hook up to your lights or your cell phone or whatever, On the negative terminal would be your ground. So thermoelectric cell materials. Uh, so one of the things, thermoelectric cells, the traditional semiconductor ones that we see most are made in factories and they, they, they take quite a bit of machinery and equipment to make. So one of the challenges we were earlier, or early in the project looking at was making our own thermoelectric cells. 
So I pulled out one of the charts to see there on the left, and I selected my two metals. I picked nichrome and constantan. And so the nichrome has, has a positive CBET coefficient, the constantan has a negative CBET coefficient. And so I, I, I theorized that if I made a thermoelectric cell of those two materials, I'd be able to generate a voltage. And so I built one, and it worked. The problem was is that it had too high of impedance for the voltage it got out. So on the right-hand side, you see almost the exact setup that I did. I, I twist the wires together on the hot end, and then I had them open on the cold end. And I, when I tested, I actually put about four in series just to get to amplify the voltage a little bit further. And then I used an insulator uh, to keep them apart. What I did is I just used a tin can, and I used heat, um, heat shrink to electrically insulate the wires from the tin can. But I did get a good result. I got my voltage, I, when I did my calculations, I needed about 100 of my cells in series to get a usable voltage. The problem was, was that my impedance was too high. So when I measured my impedance, it was on the order of several ohms, and my voltage was on the order of millivolts. And the problem was is that I keep stacking in series, that impedance is going to grow as well. And so as we'll look at later, that's a problem of maximum power transfer that happens with, uh, with these devices. So the construction, um, yeah, these are kind of my results. Nominal voltage is achieved, the high impedance, kept my maximum power down. Um, and as I'll look at in the, uh, the, the circuit later, any significant current would have a large internal voltage drop before you even got to the terminals. So that would essentially reduce my usable voltage. So this is the cell for the thermoelectric, or the, uh, the theory for the thermoelectric cell. This is the equation that kind of describes the efficiency of the cell. So you have the, uh, the alpha is the CBET coefficient, rho is the electrical resistivity, K is the thermal conductivity, and T is the temperature. And so this is kind of the, the equation that up to present day has kind of driven how we look at, uh, how we look at building these uh, thermoelectric cells. And so this is what's moved towards the semiconductors because they are, they, they are great electric conductors, poor thermal conductors, and they generally have higher CBET coefficients than pure metals or alloys of metals. This is another equation, and this, this is the power factor. So this determines your maximum power output. And so this is only a function of CBET coefficient and the electrical conductivity. And so when I get to my keen innovation, I really latched onto this equation because it has different implications in going with just the pure metal route. This is the maximum power transfer. And so this is essentially why my cell didn't, did, why the cells that I used, constantan and nichrome, couldn't output much usable power, was because I had this internal impedance. That was the impedance associated with the, the wire, the constantan and the nichrome. Uh, one of the most common uses for nichrome is for resistive heating elements. So most heaters in your house are made of nichrome. So if you're going from line voltage to ground, you want a high resistance. So nichrome has a pretty high resistance just in the normal wire. So when I built it in a thermoelectric cell, it was a pretty poor uh, power supply because of that high impedance. This, uh, this impedance was high. And so consequently, your maximum power happens when your impedance on your load equals to your internal impedance. And, and so when this, when this impedance is pretty great, it severely limits down what your maximum power can, where you can transfer because you're dissipating a lot of power within the cell itself. So the key innovation. So I focused on this equation because in a lot of thermoelectric situations, one instance is uh, cooling electrical components that you can use thermoelectric cells. And that's when you're, you're, driving, you're driving the heat, you're moving the heat from one place to the other by dispensing electrical energy to do it. When in, in energy production, it's exactly the opposite. Heat's moving through it, you're generating electricity from it. Well, in a lot of waste heat situations, uh, for instance, car radiators, um, you want the heat gone regardless. So uh, I think we're, when you're looking at the high efficiency output, high efficiency is great, but if you're not getting usable power, efficiency doesn't matter. So when we're looking at this equation, we see that we want high electrical conductivity. If we use alloys or metals with high electrical conductivity, we get a lot higher power output per unit area or volume than you would for a semiconductor. So for cars and other waste sensitive applications, uh, Driving off this equation would be a lot more beneficial because then you're carrying around less weight to produce that power. And so weight sensitive applications include stoves like ours because they have to carry it inside, outside, village to village, you know, place to place. So you don't want to have a huge thermoelectric cell. 
uh, cars, because your, your fuel efficiency within a city, at least, when you're stopping and going, is directly determined by how much your vehicle weighs, because how much energy you have to expense to get it moving and get it stopped again. Aircraft, uh, spacecraft, and many more. So I'm, I'm pushing that in situations such as those, uh, for focusing on uh, electrical conductivity is uh, focusing on electrical con conductivity will give us maximum power output while keeping our weight down. And in a lot of situations, when they've developed big thermoelectric cells for exhaust units on cars, the units are fairly large and they weigh quite a bit because the amount of material they're putting into them is pretty substantial. So when, when you're driving out this equation with metals and alloys, you can use a lot less metal and get the same kind of power output. So, and this is building off again, so the car radiator. So, uh, traditional thermoelectric cells have a very small power output on the order of, you know, milliamps of current coming out. And generally, you're not going to get more than, you know, 10 watts out of something, you know, that you can hold in your hand. Anything of a much larger size isn't going to give you much. And in a car application, you're trying to salvage waste heat. For cars, when you have a horsepower being over you know, 700 watts of energy, you need considerable power output to be getting out of it. And when you're dumping, when in your modern internal combustion engine, when you're running an efficiency of 30 to 40 percent, significant amount of your maximum power that you're dumping in via your fuel is coming back out through your radiator and you're just dumping that. So if you could salvage, even if you can't get high efficiency because you're using something with uh, high electrical and thermal conductivity like a metal, uh, maybe have lo lower efficiency than a semiconductor thermoelectric cell, but you get more usable power. Uh, so better heat transfer than exhaust in some of these uh, liquid cooling cells because in an exhaust system you're allowed to go from air uh, to metal and then radiate back out to air or some kind of heat sink. But I think the uh, the cooling system in a car has a lot higher uh, potential just because you have you have the fluids moving inside and get higher heat transfer um, through your surfaces. The, the one, the problem again with the thermoelectric cells, as I mentioned earlier, was the, the variable voltage output. And so even when we move to, you know, a, a metal alloy thermoelectric cell, we're still going to have issues with the variable voltage and finding a way to get that usable for your electronics. So even if that's within a car, most cars are on 12 volts. And in our application for the stove, we want to charge cell phones, which happens at 5 volts. So in either application, you need some kind of device that's going to take your variable voltage output of thermoelectric cell and make it usable for your electronics. And so in our case with the stove, we picked the charge pump. Uh, traditionally, we'd use a linear voltage regulator, and to get a 5 volt output out of a linear voltage regulator, you need about 7 volts in, minimum. If there's any less than 7, you're not going to get a, a steady output. And if there's, and it can go anywhere, some of them will go up to 20 some volts. The problem is, is as you increase the voltage on the linear voltage regulator, you're just burning that off as heat. So consequently, they need large, generally large heat sinks and they're not very efficient because the higher the voltage you put in, the more their efficiency drops and just dissipating that heat away. The charge pump is a solid state device, uses capacitors and transistors to switch and build up voltage. And so it can take anywhere from 2.7 volts up to 11.8 and convert it to the usable 5 volts that we needed for the cell phone charging. This allowed us to bring down the size of our thermoelectric cell considerably and uh, it, it increased the efficiency of the whole system. The unit itself costs about $4 which more than made up for the cost savings we made on the thermoelectric cells. Uh, in years past, we were using about $50 per thermoelectric cell. Um, this year, we moved down to the unit you see there is about $15, and then we added the $4 charge pump. So we had considerable savings there. So in kind of conclusion, I want to thank my team that helped me work on this. And we all, it was kind of a team effort. This picture was taken uh, just, just last week. We were in Washington, D.C. presenting this to the EPA. Our, our project is part of the EPA P3, and we're on a, we're a phase two team, and this is the, we were presenting our findings here. We weren't eligible for the next phase of it, but we were just presenting what findings we found in this next year. So, any questions?